You are listening to the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network. Visit PencilandPaperProductions.Podbean.com to find more great podcasts. I'm Katrina, and I love anime. I'm Steven, and I'm aware of anime. But what if that affection could rub off? Perhaps that excitement in her eyes got me curious. I could offer up some solid anime. I could give them a watch, just to see what all the fuss is about. And maybe, just maybe, I could learn to love anime too. Welcome to Inspired by a Weeaboo. Welcome back, my Weeaboo family. We just finished episode 7 of Death Parade. So, Stephen, what did you think? Well, we're going back into character building, but it's a good episode for that, I would guess, because it answered a few lingering questions that I guess, if you're watching it, you may have, and then you may be asking, but maybe you didn't think that they were important, per se, Yeah. but I feel like it did kind of give a lot more insight into certain characters so now we're a little bit more aware of maybe what their intentions are. Maybe that there's other things at play. Yeah. Because I am curious about uh, a few things that were laid out. Uh, we kind of get introduced to Oculus at first. He's playing pool. Kind of seems like he's missing his pool buddy, Nona. Yeah. <laughs> and they don't really kind of go too deep into that. I, I think they were just kind of being like, yeah, he's, he's going to play a part in this, mm-hmm. you know, a little mm-hmm. later. Uh, then we kind of go back to the black-haired girl, which we kind of learned two episodes ago that her name could possibly be Chavo, maybe? Maybe? Maybe. Maybe. Uh, but I guess we'll call her black-haired girl for now since we're not 100% sure, but they did kind of lean into that a little bit here, in a way. Uh, then we kind of see that, uh, what was his name? Ginty? Yeah, Ginty. Yes. Uh, he's he's struggling still with the uh, lack of judgment with the girl and I'm guessing the boy, even though we didn't see him. Uh, mm-hmm. And the girl seems to be driving Ginty up the wall <laughs> because she's kind of dug herself in a little bit, gotten friendly with his cat, yeah. and he's just frustrated by her. Yeah. But I'm also kind of curious if that frustration is going to lead him to do something rash because he seems like a hothead. Yeah, he does. And I'd hate to see her thrown into the void just because he's frustrated with her. But at least he's showing restraint because he could have easily done that by now. I'm surprised he hasn't, you know, given his uh, attitude. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was kind of a... They didn't really dwell on that too much in this episode it was more like we're just going to touch on it for a moment and then move along but the main story seemed to be focused more on uh introducing a new character but more about Deckham and what his purpose is yeah because we got introduced to Quinn and that's pretty clever Quinn and Deckham Quinn Deckham but she used to be the arbiter of the Quindecum. Yes. And Deckham was there to replace her so mm-hmm. she could have a, well, I guess you'd say a promotion, but she didn't seem too thrilled about it. Yeah, she definitely did not seem too thrilled about it. I because, mean, she did at the beginning, but I guess after, I think they said he has been the arbiter for, uh, on the Quindecum for five years, I think is what it said in one of the other episodes. Mm-hmm. So... I guess five years at her new job, it's not all sunshine and rainbows like she thought it was going to be. So Yeah, because they said that she's uh, condensing memories, right? Yes. So are the memories she's condensing, is that what she's sending to the Arbiters? Yes. Okay, so she's trying to, to make their jobs easier, I guess, in a way. Well, that's how they get, you know, I guess pretty much the information... Right. That they get. So she is part, they did say she's part of the information bureau. So basically they get all the fragmented pieces of a memory and they have to try and piece them together for the arbiters. But 
it's more in kind of a fractioned type piecing. Mm-hmm. But uh, when they actually show them, it's kind of like a, I guess, kind of like a mosaic. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Where like all the pieces are just kind of put together. But it's it's like a pretty image, but it's not anything you could technically like make out. Right. So it's kind of cool to, you know, see it and think about. Mm-hmm. I guess that's how it all happens and everything. And then it gets sent to all the arbiters. So, Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't really dwell on her too much. They just kind of, at this point, kind of pointed out, you know, who she was, where she, where she's at now, and then mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, she just seemed like she was happy just to be away from it all for a moment because yeah. she went to go visit Nona, and that's how we got introduced to her. And they were kind of chatting it up for the most part, and then of course Quinn got hammered, yeah, you know, like she was just trying to get away from it all, but. Focus more on the the Deckham flashback. He was talking to the black haired girl, and I can't remember what brought up going back to that flashback. But the book, the book, yeah, yes, the, the Chavo book, book. The yes, because the yeah, the the black haired girl. We didn't uh, say that, but she found she was looking through some books and she found the storybook just yes. called titled Chavo that she had been dreaming about that mm-hmm. we talked about two episodes ago. And so she was asking about that, curious about it, and then that led into a flashback of his first day, mm-hmm. uh, where he was. At, I guess he started with uh, Ginty. Ginty. So they were kind of starting out the first day together, and and seeing kind of how they were getting accustomed to everything, and then we saw them get their little wands. Their yeah, little their little wands. cheater wands. Yeah. <laughs> Where and I guess they were kind of showing because there were two guests in there in the Quindecum mm-hmm. that uh, Quinn was kind of overseeing, but then they were there to kind of play with their little wands and kind of mess with the people and try to understand what the purpose of it was. Because obviously, I think we've touched on that before. It's to entice some form of emotion, yes, to kind of get a read on the people you're judging. So. They were supposed to be pressing the button, trying to, to work them up, mm-hmm. you know, and all that. And Deckham didn't push his button. And Nona took note of that. And she questioned him on it. And he just said that he was distracted by the people more than anything. Uh, and they were just like, huh, that's kind of weird. But, you know, you just kind of shrug it off. It's because he seems kind of like, I don't want to say he's like a robot, but he, he does come off like, meh. About Which a lot of things. It's funny because when the episode starts, um, as Oculus is playing his game of pool, he's quoting the three rules of an arbiter. Mm-hmm. And they are rule number one is an arbiter cannot stop judging people's souls because that is what they're there for. Mm-hmm. So basically, you know, that's their meaning of living, I guess you could say. Right. Uh, Number two is they cannot experience death. And when he's, you know, kind of going through his little monologue, it's basically if they experience death, then they're going to have a biased opinion. So therefore, they can't judge souls properly. Sure. And then number three, uh, we actually get quoted again in the episode is they cannot have human emotions. Mm -hmm. because that is not what they are built for and they say that dummies cannot have emotions so basically all of the arbiters including Deckham are dummies they're mannequins yeah and you know they're supposed to be the soulless you know I guess creatures in a way because they're not human have never been human Mm mm-hmm But the interesting thing is, is that they say they can't have emotions, but yet every arbiter that we have seen has had some form of emotion. Right, right. So, except for Deckham. Mm -hmm. But it's also pointed out in the episode that Nona messed with Deckham's mind, I guess it would be, and Mm -hmm. she actually implanted human emotions. Right, which is odd that he would be the one that doesn't exactly. 
So, so he's the most robotic. I mean, even Ginty being the asshole that he is, he has those emotions. He gets mm-hmm. angry. He, you know, loves his cat. He loves, uh, we saw in the episode that was all about him. He had these little dolls that he made. Because, you know, Nona tells them in episode seven in the flashback that they need to have something that they cherish. Mm -hmm. And Deckham has his mannequins that he dresses up and, you know, displays around the Quindeckham. And Genti has these little old fashioned wooden Japanese dolls. Mm -hmm. So he gets upset when one of the uh, when the the boy and the girl come in and the boy messes with his one of his little dolls. Right. So they have emotions. Mm-hmm. So it's just, I don't know, it's kind of odd that Deckham has human emotions, which Oculus does not know about. Yeah. So that's one yeah. of the other interesting things is Nona has gone behind the quote unquote God of this, you know, or I get, he says he's not God, but he's basically the closest thing to God. Yeah, they So she went behind, you know, this god's back and gave a arbiter human emotions, mm-hmm. which is against, you know, the laws of an arbiter. But it does seem like it benefits him though. I mean, not not in the sense that he seems like he's more observant because he's more robotic, but I am curious to know and I hope they explain it later on as mm-hmm. to why the human emotions in him are not working against him like i mean why is it the opposite why is having human emotions making him more robotic i don't know so that's that's an interesting question i have um but after they kind of go through uh, i guess under seeing their first day and all that Mm kind of go back to the black-haired girl and there was a there was something that quinn asked um or, or kind of brought up about the job, about having something you treasure. Yeah. Wasn't it something like that? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that was part of the flashback, part of the story. And then the black-haired girl asked Deckham, well, what do you treasure most? And then we kind of go and we observe his mannequin collection that we've mentioned in the past. Mm-hmm. That he has these mannequins and freaks people out. But we find out what the mannequins are, which also kind of leads into what you were talking about with Deckham being a dummy, Mm -hmm. is that they are former guests. Yes. You know, those, when their bodies go either to the void or they're reincarnated. No, their souls. Their souls. Mm -hmm. So when they go to wherever they're supposed to go, they leave behind their body, but it's a mannequin. Yes. Or it's it's whatever's left. I guess you could look at it as in their souls are kind of, um, the mannequin is like a, um, what would you call it? A A, husk of who they used to be. So it takes on, you know, their appearance and everything and their souls are kind of there, but it's just a temporary body until they get judged and then their souls leave, but the mannequin remains. Yeah. So, so all the mannequins he had were former guests. Yes. And he's just collected them and held them. But he had a reason. It wasn't just like, ooh, I love dead bodies. <laughs> like I'm some <laughs> devilish fool. He just said that he doesn't want them to be forgotten. Yes. You know, because they used to be somebody. And yes. I guess that could be tapping in a little bit to his human emotions. Yeah. Is that he feels that. It's wrong for them to be forgotten. They used to be somebody. Yeah. They had their judgment, but they shouldn't be forgotten. Yes, because he also explains that arbiters, because, you know, they see so many guests come through that they have to periodically forget about each one of them. So Mm -hmm. even all of his mannequins that he has displayed that you see throughout the episodes, he doesn't remember who they are. He just knows that they were guests that he had. And therefore, they're special to him. And if you noticed, I don't know if you noticed that or not, but the mannequin that he put together for the black haired girl Mm -hmm. as he's showing her what he's doing, it is based off of the girl from the very first episode. Okay. So I was wondering if there was a significance to it, but Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't piece that together. But uh, he mentioned that he had, you know, respect for humans in this regard. And I thought that was he has respect for humans who have lived a fulfilling life right 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 so it's it's an interesting it there's a lot to that when you start to 
put all the puzzle pieces together as to yes. why he's been doing this, what he's been doing, and then learning facts about him just being kind of a, I don't want to say a pawn, but I kind of feel like he is in a way, like Nona's doing this for a reason. She's she's put yes. all this together for a purpose. Mm-hmm. So he is kind of a pawn in her little game that she's trying to, I don't really feel like she's trying to win a game. She's she's trying to, I feel like she's trying to experiment. There you go. That's the I word I was looking for. I think she's trying to prove a point. Okay. Because from the way that the arbiters speak, I think when uh, we saw Nona and the first time we saw Oculus, he asked her how long she's been in charge because he's the one that placed her in charge. And she, she said it was like 86 years or something like that. Mm-hmm. So she's been in charge of the entire area for this long. And I mean, she looks like a young girl. Yeah. And I mean, I can only imagine even when uh, Quinn was talking like she got tired of it. She got tired of judging and not tired as in like, Oh, this is just so drag. It like weighs on them. Yeah. You know, because they are literally the people who decide if these, you know, if these people get to live another life, or if they're just going to be lost and forgotten forever. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I can't imagine how much that would weigh on somebody. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, and then they're they're not supposed to have emotions. They know that they're dolls. They know that, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's still, I guess that feeds into the point that Nona's trying to make is she thinks that they should be able to judge based on something other than just being a soulless doll. Mm-hmm. So she wanted Deckham to have human emotions and he doesn't know that he has them. Yeah. So that's the other thing. He's, I mean, clueless. He knows that he's different and he values things that the other arbiters don't. But to him, I mean, this is his job and he values it. He wants to make the best decisions. He wants to do the best that he can at his job. But I can also see how much it would weigh on him too. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why he cherishes the people who had fulfilling lives and stuff like that. Like they, I guess, kind of lived out their purpose. Even if they had an untimely death, he still values them and respects them yeah. when the other arbiters don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm I'm curious to see where they where it goes and, yeah. and where it's leading to. I guess with all these new facts in place about them. Um, I know that Nona had made a, a comment kind of casually to Quinn about trying to format like different forms of judgment, yes. you know, with so many souls coming down and stuff like that. So yes. that kind of made me think that was kind of one of her reasons behind this, you know, experiment just to see if there could be another way. And then, like you said, maybe prove a point. Yes. Because if you have multiple ways to do things, maybe you can find which one's the best way. So maybe that's it. Maybe, I don't know. There's could be more. I don't know. Um, but Oculus, he came looking for Nona. And she seemed, for, for somebody to be, like, that's her boss, yeah. I guess, in a way. <laughs> yeah. She seems so uppity with him, like. She's almost in control of him in a way because she was like, I told you never to come here. And he's like, I'm just, you know, you didn't give me much choice. You I know, think she knows around. that even though he seems like this sweet old man that just wants, you know, his pool buddy back and everything, that he's not as sweet and innocent as he appears. Yeah, I'm, I've been kind of waiting for him to turn, make a dark turn somewhere and just like whip out his god hand and be like bitch let me tell you something yeah. you know <laughs> but i mean again he's 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 playing it cool and i think that's why i'm expecting a moment like that because he's just gonna come yeah. off nice and sweet and then finally it's gonna be like look and then his eyes go all dark and be like oh here it comes which is gonna be hard because he already has really creepy eyes yeah like his hair looks amazing <laughs> because for an old man, if you notice, uh, he ha- he kind of has like a man bun mm. and then he has a goatee, but they're both in the shape of lotus flowers that are closed. 
So next time they show him, pay attention to that because okay. his beard and his hair are in the shape like a closed lotus flower. So you can actually see like the individual petals all kind of closed up. But he has these black eyes that have like the little slits, kind of like snake eyes, I mm -hmm. guess you could say. Or even, I guess, cat eyes, you know, when they're not all bugged out and trying to sure. attack play. <laughs> uh, but he just... He's definitely very off-putting. Like, even when you first meet him, when he's first introduced, you get kind of a creepy vibe from him. Mm -hmm. He's just a very... He's different than all the Arbiters. And yeah, I'm, you can I mean, that. he isn't an Arbiter anyway, but he's definitely very different. And he kind of keeps to himself because if you've noticed, he's never really interacted with the other Arbiters. He goes straight to Nona. Yeah, he's he's he, the only time we've seen him is playing pool and then right there, yes. you know, with and we will Nona. see more of him, obviously. Yeah, oh, but, I expected as much. <laughs> but he is, he's definitely you just get kind of an uneasiness from him, and I think mm -hmm. that's where Nona's kind of standoffish, uppity attitude comes from, as she knows him. I think she knows him better than anybody. So I feel like that's why she does the things that she does, including giving Deckham the emotions. Right. Now, speaking of Nona, there were two last little bits how the, the episode ended is since we were talking about Oculus, he happened to notice that she too had mm -hmm. a Chavo book, yes. you know, and... I was starting to wonder, I was like, so is this the same book as, like, did she take it or something? But no, it's just like, she's got a copy of the yes. same book that the black-haired girl does. Yes. But they didn't really explain why. It was just something she wanted. Yes. And that's all she really said. So, again, we saw that she was the one who introduced the black-haired girl to mm -hmm. Deckham. So, I'm sure that there's a tie-in we'll get to in a later episode, for sure. And because we got to get to know... We got to know the black haired girl story. Yes. And we will find out her story. But we also left out a point in this episode is when the black haired girl finds the book. You know, not only is she surprised to see it because she's been having these dreams, mm -hmm. but she actually has a flashback and she realizes that she is like the the uh, guest. She is also dead. She is, in fact, human. Mm -hmm. So... She seemed like she wanted to ask Deckham that, but then I think she's also kind of scared. Yeah. But, you know, she just kind of went along with it. So. And we still don't really have that portion of her life yet. We don't know. No, we know. Why she's there. Nothing about her other than the fact that she died and Deckham could not judge her because when she came to Quinn Deckham, she had all of her memories and she knew that she was dead. So mm -hmm. Nona erased her memories and basically gave her back to Deckham. So she's just been kind of shadowing. But this entire time, Deckham has also been watching her. So I think that he's more or less waiting. Go ahead. I'm sorry. More or less waiting for her memories to return or at least a time, a point in time where he can judge her properly. Mm hmm. And the last thing that we saw, which I was a little curious about, and I'm 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 guessing because I think we've mentioned before these episodes have little stingers. Sometimes they yes. matter. Sometimes they're goofy, like the last one, and there's <laughs> old dance routine thing or whatever. Yeah. But no, this one um, showed Nona with I can't remember her name. The one who seemed to be the. Uh, person who assigns souls to the arbiters yes uh she's sitting there looking at two and she's like hey could you give these to deckham she's like uh you know i, I really can't and you know she bribes her for these particular two mm -hmm. so i'm gonna assume that the two we see in the next episode are gonna be the two that she sent there yes and i'm gonna assume that there's a purpose for it yeah. Because I'm 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 really interested to see what that's all about. So, you know, we gotta remember to watch the stingers, even though they can be silly, yeah. goofy <laughs> like the like because this was actually returned to form, if you remember <laughs> from the last episode. That was strictly the anime episode. Yes. As we said before. You know, yeah. the one where people wanted to say, Well, that's what anime is. Yeah. 
that's yeah. that, that was it. But no, this was definitely returned to form in a in a manner of speaking. Yeah, we we definitely get the vibe that I mean, I already know what's going to happen. Yeah. But you definitely get the vibe from watching episode 7 or at least the the little ending after credit scene for episode 7 that it's definitely going to return to that dark place mm-hmm. because Nona's final line before you get the credits is that we all knew it would have to end sometime. Mm-hmm. So that definitely leads into, you know, how the show is going to end. But it for somebody who hasn't watched it, it's definitely one of those like, oh, shit, mm-hmm. stuff's about to get real. <laughs> Which is interesting so. that it was that episode because that was essentially the beginning of the last six. Yeah. So. Yeah, uh, we're almost... We're definitely getting there. Yeah, we're moving yeah, along. Almost done with it, which is kind of sad. I mean, for anybody out there that loves to watch anime, I mean, and it even ties in with like regular TV shows and stuff like that. When a mm-hmm. series ends, it's just like, ah, uh, like fulfilled and everything, as long as it has a good ending, because I have had some that did not have a good ending and I was just like, well, screw you too. But no, it definitely is a bittersweet moment and as long as it has a a decent ending yeah Yeah. because i think that's what ruins shows for me is if you get you go all that way for that Mm -hmm. journey and i Mm -hmm. you know and i think we've had there's been a lot of this lately yeah Um, by the time people (laughs) listen to this you know game of thrones has ended you know it's been over for about a month now i'd say and i know that so many people were so mad about how that ended. Oh, yeah. But, but what you have to consider is that is the narrative that was chosen for that show. Yeah. If that's not how you wanted it to go, I'm sorry. Petitions aren't going to change that, you know? That's just how it ends. That's the end of that story that was being told. Yeah. Same as a book. You read a book. Yep. Beginning to end. That's how that book ends. That's how that story ends. I mean, Sorry if it doesn't meet your expectations, but you have to take it at face value. That's that story. Yes. End. And I mean, there are definitely some, like I mentioned uh, before we, you know, started the podcast today and everything, that there is a show called Fooly Cooly, and that's one that, you know, I watched on Adult Swim and everything, and I absolutely love. And it is a short one. Mm-hmm. But when it ended... It left you with so many freaking questions. And for the longest time, you know, you thought, well, that's all I'm ever going to get. And within the past year or two, they have actually announced that they are going to be making another season of Fooly Cooly. So I, as a fan of the show, am extremely excited about it. Cool. But, I mean, with this one, I mean, how it ends is... We'll get there. Again, it's one of those bittersweet hmm. type moments because it is a good anime and I do I do really enjoy it and everything. And there are some that I have honestly I've never gotten to see the ending of because either it went off the air, you know, before I ever got to watch the final episodes or I haven't been able to find it in like box sets or anything like that. And as Steven knows, but I don't think I've ever actually stated on the show yet is I enjoy, I do enjoy anime. I freaking love it. But <laughs> I refuse to watch it with subtitles. Yeah, see, now- And I know I'm going to get shit for it. But <laughs> I love the American voice actors. And that's nothing against, like, the original Japanese casts or yeah. Korean casts or anything like that. It's just, it's something I enjoy and I feel like... When I have to watch it with subtitles, I'm not one of those people who can like multitask when I'm watching something. So I feel like I miss things if I'm having to try to read really fast, you know, really fast script and everything Mm. going across the screen. So I feel like I miss a lot of it. But I enjoy so many of the voice actors that I've heard through so many different animes. And to me, that's what I enjoy about it. But I know, obviously, Steven. Well, no, no, but but there's I can understand that to a point with yes. anime, because with anime we're talking about characters that are animated. So yes. if you've already gotten accustomed to who they are to you 
in that form, that's yes. that's understandable. For me, trying to argue in favor of sub of subtitles and the original Japanese uh, soundtrack, so to speak, is with Godzilla movies. Mm-hmm. I'm used to the actors. I see the actors, but I know that's not their voice. Yes. So. I, w- I was curious. I've always been curious, you know, growing up with dubs and everything like that. So mm-hmm. when the original Japanese audio was available, I wanted to hear it. Yeah. Because I wanted to know what these actors sounded like, what they really sounded like, because I never knew. Yeah. So it's interesting for me, and, and I feel like more personal for me, to, to know these actors in greater detail yeah. for their work. And hear them in their natural form versus animated. I understand that. I yeah. get that. So animated doesn't really bother me as much. But if if you're watching real actors, I feel like that's a necessity to relate to them and to connect with them as opposed to a floating voice that's really not theirs. Yeah. So I, I, I can understand that. <clears throat> I get it. And I mean, as we have discovered <laughs> from a a cartoon that you know was not originally in um english which would be digimon Mm -hmm. and as we discovered i mean obviously a lot of like the subtitles and stuff like that a lot of um japanese words don't translate come like don't translate properly or at least it's not it's not the exact same thing and plus, I feel like in Japan, they are a little bit more lenient yeah. about their uh, content, so to speak, because yeah. they're not automatically saying, well, this is this is for little kids. We're, we're making this for children yeah. and stuff like that. So <laughs> Netflix had, this is years ago, and it yes. might still be on there, uh, Netflix had put Digimon on mm-hmm. uh on the the service and but they also released the Japanese versions of that same show. Yes. And you talk about a vast comparison <laughs> because we're talking about a show that when it aired here it was on Fox Kids. So yes, it was, it was no different than Pokemon. Yeah, they, like you the, were a child and you were like, "Oh my god, digital monsters." And that was its purpose. It was yes. trying to tap into that craze. It was something very similar to it. So you get all that voice acting, all that craziness with the monsters and everything like that. So that was its purpose is to emulate that as much as it could and really drive that home. But as we were watching because I was watching with some sort of intrigue because yeah. we had the Japanese version at our disposal and I mm-hmm. knew that you know subtitles was going to be one of those things that I'd have to argue over <laughs> but yeah I knew I was curious I was just like this I want to know how much they actually kept in you know the content together and yeah. I'd say for the most part a lot of the beats were similar yes but dialogue scene placement things like that they changed one in particular and i knew this for a fact when i saw it and this is where we're going with this it's a long yes, drawn out is... way to tell you the story yep. but, but i just wanted story. you to be aware <laughs> there was an episode we were watching mm-hmm. and in the episode and i wish i could remember the character's names it was the main kid and his little uh t-rex buddy yes and they had to like they were in a, a house together haunted house or something like that and then you kind of was like, oh, I'm scared. I got to go to the bathroom, something like that. Or one of the kids said he needed to go somewhere. So they walk in there and they're talking and just kind of bantering about. But then one of the bad guys is hiding in one of the stalls. And then they're just, all the the two main characters are doing is just talking about, oh, I'm so scared in here. Oh, what are we going to do? All that stuff. And then they cut back to the main guy, or to the bad guy. And he just makes this distorted face out of the blue. Well, it, as you if you recall, the uh, T Rex little Digimon is using the bathroom, so make sure you. you okay, know, well, say that. he's yes, supposed he to was, be using the restroom, yes, but he's again, in they the don't, bathroom. They're still talking. Yeah, but they so, don't. Yes. they don't acknowledge it by anything. But hey, they they just went to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. But anyway. Dude just makes a face out of the blue, bursts out, and then be like, oh, my God, it's the guy. And they just freak out. And 
I was just, there was something about that reaction. I was like, that is an odd reaction for how that scene played out. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I bet you somebody ripped one. Let's go, let's go. And so I found that particular episode in the yes. Japanese dub. You go back to that scene, plays out completely differently. Yeah. You go back in there. The Digimon has to go to the bathroom and he is taking a shit. And yes. it's just raw. He's like going just, on about how it's like, you know, it's so bad. Yeah, and, you know, like, his oh belly God, hurts and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, some pretty <laughs> rank humor at that point. Oh, yeah. It's got all kinds of nasty sounds and everything. And it's, oh, it was great. And then we cut to the bad guy making that face and it all makes sense. It was yes. like, that's, yeah, of course. Because yep. he's having to sit there and smell that because he's trying to be sneaky. And then he has to sit there next to the stall with all that noise going on, it's probably pretty rank. And then he burst out like, oh my God, I can't take this anymore. Yep. So it's interesting if you can find that. And it made me want to go and watch the entire Japanese <laughs> series at that point. Because I was like, what else did they change? Yeah. You know, I wanted to know that. I was curious. Because it's completely different. So I find that more fascinating sometimes. But I... I appreciate it more if they'll keep to it but i understand they couldn't have done that on fox kids yeah they couldn't have done that obviously so, i mean i they could but they'd be like you have mad parents why are you playing such terrible noises my kid doesn't need to hear that yeah. or whatever they'd say at the time i don't know you know i mean that is i mean with that one again it's one of those things where you know you can kind of understand it because it is directed a lot more towards children but most anime is not. Even when it looks bright and bubbly and you're like, oh, my child would love this. Mm -hmm. Make sure you do your research. Make yeah. sure you actually look into it. Look at the rating. I mean, everything. Because you'll have these bright, bubbly, beautiful animes and it gets dark, twisted, or it gets sexual. I mean, it... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, nothing against Japanese people or anything like that, but they do have a lot more of the sexual type things and stuff like that in their animes. They do get very dark. They can get bloody. They can just get off the wall, just gruesome. But I think that also speaks to our difference in culture. It does. how they allow that and they're not afraid to touch on it because you go to any other country in the world and sex is not taboo. Like it is here. Yeah. Here, it just like we can't talk about it. Can't talk about it, even though it's a natural part of the yes. world. You know, people have sex. That's that's life. Animals mm -hmm. have sex. We know this for a fact. Uh, so, but everywhere else, they're like, yeah, it, it's that's life for you. Yeah. But here, we we have to hide and we have to shame anybody who who does certain things. So I find that fascinating as well. That why we have chosen to make it taboo versus. You know, just saying, you know, get over it. That's life. Sadly, I think a lot of it has to come down to religion, but we're not going to get into that. No, nope, no, nope, let's not. <laughs> but <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, there's there's very few anime that I've watched that I I guess that it was so dark that I couldn't continue watching it. Mm -hmm. And there's one in particular that I started watching the first season and within like the first few episodes I just couldn't bring myself to watch it anymore. Wow. And it was one of those it was um I'm trying to remember if I remember the name right. I want to say it's Fate Stay Night but I don't think that's right. It was about uh basically people like regular humans get um fighters that are from the from history mm -hmm. like uh the main one is um oh what's his name i don't know or her name it wasn't a he it was a her uh, 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 uh no oh no it's a he <laughs> in history ah but she's actually a she it's it Milan? gets into so much more <laughs> uh king arthur ah isn't that who Wouldn't had the uh sword yeah that yes excalibur gotcha there we go. And they have to fight to the death for the Holy Grail. And basically, if they get the Holy Grail, it's like you can make all your wishes come true and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the fighters, this young boy gets one and he's, I think he was like a clown 
or something like that. And he was, uh, or clown-esque, but he was like a serial killer. And, you you know, you get the vibe that there are kind of good ones and then there are just like really fucked up fighters. And he comes down into like this catacomb uh, where his fighter is and all you see are dead children. And I'm talking like little bitty kids that mm-hmm. this fighter had kidnapped and killed. And I mean, they're just dismembered and everything. And it was that episode where I was like, nope, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> like it, I I can't, as my husband knows, I don't like watching a lot of regular movies or TV shows or anything like that where children die. Like it kills me. It makes me cry. And I just don't want to do it. And even with anime, there's very few that I can watch where, like, little kids die and stuff like that. And, like, I can continue on with it. But that one, just seeing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these bodies and everything just laying around, I I could not do it anymore. And And they've come out with other seasons, and I have refused to watch them because of that. Mm -hmm. So... I mean, there's, I'm sure there's people out there. I know people who have watched them and love them and everything like that, but I just, I cannot do it. Now, in regards to what she's talking about, I mean, I can, I can do it. Um, I don't have that knee jerk reaction that I have to cut it off, but I feel like don't do it just for the sake of shock value. Yes. If you, if it needs to happen in the story, it better service the story. Because yes. I've noticed certain uh, movies or things like that, it'll just kill a kid just to kill a kid. And it's like, well, what purpose did that serve? Mm-hmm. You know? Like, one movie that I, I hold in high regard that I feel like it serves a purpose to the story in a way, and this, there may be others, but this is just the first one that comes to mind most of the time is uh, the original Assault on Precinct 13 by John Carpenter. There's a scene in there, a little girl's trying to get uh, an ice cream cone, and, you know, her father's just waiting for her to go talk to the ice cream man. The entire city, if you don't know, is, like, being overrun by criminals and stuff like that. They had just taken over this ice cream truck. She didn't know. And then this lunatic just shoots her for no reason. So what that does is the father sees that and he goes into panic mode and he goes chasing after him, you know, because they just killed his daughter. But then they in turn kind of flip it around and start chasing him and his direction winds up at the police precinct where the entire movie kind of takes place from that point on. So the reason the police station gets overrun by criminals is because they're after that guy. So it served a purpose. Yeah. There may have been other reasons to go for it or to do it, but in that regard to the story, it served a purpose. There was a reason she died. There was a reason for it all that you can understand and relate to. So I get it. Yeah. You know, but again, just don't do it gratuitously and I, I, I will be okay with it. Yeah. And that's definitely one thing that a lot of animes do not hold back on when they have death and stuff like that. It'll be gory. Yeah. I mean, you can count on it. It's going to be gory. You're going to see dismemberment. I mean, it's like a Saw movie. So, (laughs) again, goes back to if if you have a child that enjoys anime, there are a lot of them that they can enjoy. I mean, the uh, Ghibli movies definitely Mm -hmm. are... A lot of them are kid-based. There are some... That you probably don't need to let your small children watch until they get a little older. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them are directed, you know, towards kids. And, of course, adults enjoy them, too. I freaking, I worship Ghibli. They're well-written stories, you know. And I think that's the beauty of them. And and they would be perfect fodder for this podcast. Yes. So we could just sit down and chat about one of them. There's so many good ones. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But it's just, I mean... Even my sister, she enjoys anime and my nephew has gotten into it and he's come to her and she makes it to where he's allowed to watch it, but she has to watch it first. Yeah. So that's definitely a good thing. I mean, we've seen so many people throughout the years take small children to movies and stuff like that, like freaking Ted. We went and saw Ted and all these parents saw were, oh, it's about a teddy bear. Yes, but it's Did you not, not about see a the child teddy bear. So, 
again, just definitely look at the ratings. If you are kind of iffy about even with the rating, give it a watch. If you feel like it's okay for your children to watch, then let them watch it. Mm-hmm. But that's on that's on you. So yeah. not us. Yeah, we didn't do it. Definitely not. I mean, we I don't think we actually stated, but Death Parade is rated uh, TVMA. And you'd think so with a, a name like you know yes. Death Parade, which by the way we didn't talk about the name of this episode. I normally bring it up. It was alcohol poisoning. Yes, which you should know by now if you clicked on this. But just saying, which was just... kind. I mean, it kind of pertained to it because I mean, obviously they're they run a freaking bar. Hmm. But it definitely, it wasn't one of those, I don't know, I guess it's one of those, it could have been named something else and you never thought differently. But it diverges, you know, like we were saying, they were all death related and everything like that. And the last few have not been death related. So ah, we'll get, I'm sure we'll see it again, but I'm just saying "Ah, it's tweaked and stuff like that. So I think that's interesting. But with that being said, we are going to continue. And, you know, like, comment, subscribe, hit us up if you got any animes that you think, you know, I would enjoy or that my husband would enjoy. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely give them a watch. I'm always open for new animes. And, yeah. So, got anything else you want to say there? Well, uh, if you are loving this podcast, you want to show anybody or point them in the direction of this podcast, tell them to find us on the Pencil and Paper Podcast Network found on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and even on YouTube.com slash Pencil Paper Productions. Yes. And like always, my Weeaboo family, we are sending you much love. Come back and give us a listen. Watch the animes that, you know, we watch. Or if you've already seen them, again, hit us up. So, yeah. Much love, and we will see you next time. This has been a Pencil and Paper Podcast Network production.